Have you ever found yourself looking at a picture of the lunar lander and thinking, huh, that thing looks sort of funky, I wonder what's going on there? Well, if so, you're in luck because we're going to talk about exactly why it looks the way it does. If you're here for the quick answer, the outer shape you see is actually created by the thermal protection blanket and micrometeoroid shield, and when we peel that away you see the real, highly utilitarian shape and structure of the module below. Here's a picture, now you know. But if you have a few more minutes, feel free to stick around and learn a bit more about the structure and some other fun details about the Lunar Module Ascent Stage. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is everything? The large cylindrical section in the center is the crew compartment, and the area immediately behind the crew compartment is the midsection. Both of these areas are pressurized, so the crew do not need spacesuits to be inside. Outside of the pressurized areas, we have the aft equipment bay, which includes a lot of electronics equipment for things like guidance, control, electrical power, and communications. The large sphere mounted using struts on the right side of this image is the fuel tank, which is Aerozine 50. Of course, rocket fuel requires an oxidizer, which is contained in a similar tank on the opposite side of the spacecraft. Underneath the midsection, behind the crew compartment, the ascent engine is tucked away, which is used to lift off of the moon when the spacecraft detaches from the lower landing stage. There are also several booms attached around the spacecraft. These hold small, multi-directional thrusters that control the rotation and fine-tuned position of the spacecraft. These other booms hold the antennas. Now, as far as entering and exiting the spacecraft, which is often an important part of a manned vehicle, there are two hatches. There's one up front that you can see here, and it's how the astronauts left the lander to walk on the surface of the moon. The other hatch is at the top, which allowed the lander to connect to the capsule, also known as the command module, and create one pressurized internal volume between the two spacecraft. Flanking either side of the front hatch are the windows that the two-person crew used to see the surface below during their descent. And finally, if you take all this junk and try to cover it as best you can with a thermal blanket and shield, you get something that looks a lot like this. And as you probably know, there's no atmosphere in space or on the moon, so aerodynamics don't play a role in the shape, which gives the lunar lander its highly utilitarian look that has now become iconic. Anyways, let's dive a bit deeper into some interesting details about the construction and engineering. The pressure vessel structure is almost entirely aluminum, with the exception of titanium fittings and fasteners. The construction method is actually fairly similar to how planes are designed and built. A very thin skin forms the airtight volume, and the structure is given stiffness with ribs and stringers, basically all of these grids and protrusions and whatnot that you see around the pressure vessel. The skin is chemically milled away in some areas to reduce thickness even further, which can get down to a thickness of less than 12 thousandths of an inch, or 0.3 millimeters. So you can see why they needed a micrometeoroid shield on the outside of the structure. A small piece of debris or space rock could pierce the skin extremely easily without it. Speaking of the micrometeoroid shield, let's dive into that a bit further. So, of course, the outer covering serves two purposes to protect the sensitive equipment and structure from temperature extremes caused both by the vacuum of space and radiation from the sun, and to protect against impacts from micrometeoroids. To make sure the blanket is thermally isolated from the craft, glass fiber standoffs are used to attach it to the structure, and in the case of the fuel tanks, they even built a frame around the spheres to ensure the blanket doesn't touch them. This is what created that slightly awkward looking flat panel spheroid shapes on either side of the lander. The thermal blanket is made up of at least 25 layers of extremely thin mylar or H film, which are basically plastic films, and each layer is coated with an extremely small amount of aluminum. The sheets are also crinkled by hand to improve the insulation by reducing contact area. Areas that are expected to get extremely hot such as around the control thrusters, have additional nickel foil and wire mesh present. The micrometeoroid shield is a second layer that stands off from the thermal blanket, spaced a minimum of two inches away from the underlying structure. It's composed of aluminum in the thickness range of four thousandths to eight thousandths of an inch, so it isn't expected to completely stop every micrometeoroid, 
but rather slow it down and break it up enough so that after passing through the thermal blanket as well, it's relatively harmless when it reaches the actual spacecraft structure. Anyways, these two layers of film plastic and aluminum crinkled purposely often give the entire lander sort of a ragtag appearance when you see it, but looking below, you can tell it's a very highly engineered vehicle. Moving on to the windows, the story of their design is actually pretty fascinating and showcases a great engineering principle. If you can't make the requirements work, then it's time to challenge the requirements. So you can see here, they have these very small triangular windows, which are relatively easy to build and integrate to the structure. On the other hand, the original lander concept had these huge windows that would have been almost impossible to build lightweight, and even today would be difficult to design and build. The windows were so massive and heavy because the crew were sitting down within the spacecraft, and all the engineers took that as a given. That requirement meant that in order to give good visibility from a seated position, the windows needed to be large, almost the entire size of the front of the spacecraft. The engineers challenged the requirement to be seated after realizing that perhaps the crew doesn't need to be seated at all, and instead they could stand, you know, kind of like a public bus or a subway. Joking aside, the lander was only going to operate in 1-6 Earth gravity on the moon, and the thrust from the ascent engine was relatively weak, so standing wasn't much of a risk. Also, the landing legs had crushable impact, attenuating struts to limit shock loads on touchdown. Standing within the crew compartment meant that they could get their bodies directly up against the front wall, and therefore their eyeballs directly up to the windows. They therefore had a relatively good field of view from a small triangular shaped window, thus lightening the vehicle by hundreds of pounds and reducing a lot of design complexity and risk. If you're interested to see more details of the lunar module design process at Grumman, dramatized for television, I recommend checking out the series From the Earth to the Moon, produced by Tom Hanks, specifically episode 5 called Spider. Speaking of which, Spider was one of the several nicknames for the lunar module, obviously because of its spidery-like appearance. The command module had a similar fun nickname, Gumdrop, because it looked like, well, yeah. Other fun facts about the engineering of the lander can be found from that episode. For example, the front hatch that the crew used to walk on the moon was originally round, but the crew asked that they change to square since the backpacks on the spacesuits were square. You can see in some of my pictures the front hatch is still circular. These pictures were taken of Lunar Test Article 1 one of the lunar modules designed for testing and validation. This vehicle was built before the crew asked for the hatch to be changed. If you want to see this vehicle, as well as a real lunar module that would have flown on an actual Apollo mission had the program not been cancelled early, the Cradle of Aviation Museum on Long Island, New York has them both on display. Anyways guys, I think that'll just about do us for now. If you stuck around, thanks for listening. Hopefully you got something out of this video. My plan for this channel is a bit freeform. I'm a mechanical slash aerospace engineer with a lot of different interests that constantly change and evolve over time, so I thought I'd make a channel about whatever interests me at any given time. I think I'm going to do some videos like this where I just talk about or explain a topic, and other videos where I actually do something or make something. For example, the next video will be simulating rocket trajectories using Python, and I have plans for the future to make a deployable model of the lunar module landing gear. If that sounds like something that interests you, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you then. Bye.